All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the uh, Craft Beer Professionals. And uh, I guess this morning we'll talk a little bit about uh, sanitation. But what I'd like to do is talk a little bit less about sanitation than actually really the, the basics that are the underlying principle of sanitation, which means how we can get our equipment clean and what's really going on in the background. So I um, guess I'm going to jump right in and we're going to get started. So why are we actually cleaning? Well, I mean, obviously for hygienic reasons, the good news, unless you make an alcohol-free beer or mixed drinks or soft drinks, uh, that you can't kill anybody with beer thanks to the high alcohol content and the low pH value. So pathogens don't really grow, but at the same time, from economic reason, and we've seen this in the past, you know, uh, you put out a couple bad batches of beer that are infected with Pediococcus or some other uh, funky bacteria uh, that can very quickly put a dent in your business plan and uh, potentially even take you out of business. So our primary objective is to protect our beer from contamination and spoiling. Um, how do we do this? We obviously want to remove product residues uh, that can function as a gross media for microorganisms, beer, you know, is a great media for that. Um, if we have more than one yeast strain or, you know, drastically different beers, we also want to obviously avoid cross-contamination. Um, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, we really can't get perfect cleaning results um, unless we follow up our cleaning with a sanitizer and that should be a, a dedicated separate cycle. Um, you know, unless you answer the bush and you pasteurize everything or Miller and, you know, don't really have to worry about that. Um, you know, you really need to sanitize and make sure that you come out with a zero count environment or as close to it as possible. And equally important, we should always look at cleaning and sanitizing, you know, uh, as a combined program or what I like to call a comprehensive uh, sanitation program. You know, neither one by itself will really work or make a difference. And one a very important thing to remember that you cannot sanitize the dirty surface. So if we miss anything up front, then that's going to cause us problems. Yeah, but sounds pretty easy, right? What could possibly go wrong with this one? Well, here are some pictures from the field. And I'd like to remind you, these are not small breweries. These are 50,000 barrels uh, all the way up to several hundred thousand barrel breweries where I took these pictures. Um, this is actually a, uh, um, a tank top assembly valve um, where this came from. Uh, this one here is the inside of a, uh, a water cooler, uh, a heat exchanger. What you see, all this rough stuff in there is all biofilm. Um, here we see the phenomena of super concentrated droplets. And I don't know if you uh, can see my mouse here. You see these lines coming down the side of the tank here. This is what happens if you don't rinse your sanitizer, let it sit, and uh, it'll pit the heck out of your tank. Um, beer stone, limestone, uh, you know, whatever, uh, hot liquor tank. A uh, cold liquor tank, um, even tanks by itself. This is actually a stainless steel tank, believe it or not. <clears throat> when we were done with this one, it was nice and shiny again, but this is how we entered this tank. Uh, halogen corrosion, the use of uh, iodophores, uh, chlorine dioxide, or you know other halogens without rinsing will give you this result um, in the headspace, for example. Um, this is another top of a tank. You see the spray ball in the middle scene where the tank was not passivated or pickled after manufacturing. You even still see the manufacturing marks in there and footsteps. It's kind of fascinating. Um, <clears throat> the uh, inside of a keg washer, if you don't take care of that one. So this is how this can quickly turn out. This is the caustic tank. Um, another uh, tank with uh, a lot of beer stone or lime scale. Hard to tell the difference here. Um, the inside of a keg. You know, so uh, especially in the area here where we have a lot of keg sharing, keg fleet management companies, where you really don't know what the previous brewery did, uh, we end up with kegs like this that are impossible, almost impossible to clean in just one single step. Um, this is the inside of a uh, water tank. Uh, you see the pitting from chlorides in there in the manway. Um, this is the inside of a hot liquor tank. Here we see a bunch of biofilm and bioslime that has accumulated because the tank was never CIP'd. Um, <clears throat> sanitary welts. So if you ever wonder why you have micro counts in your beer and they won't go away, if you have welts like this, there's no way that, that you can properly sanitize it without stuff getting left behind. 
and the inside gasket also doesn't look all that hip. Um, talking about gasket and butterfly valve maintenance, you know, if you have uh, gaskets that look like this, I don't care how well you sanitize and how well you try to do things, you will not get this without counts. Um, again, talking about proper welding, you know, this is not the way to do it. Um, yep, yeah, and I can get all the way to this one here. This is actually from a word line in an almost 100,000 barrel brewery that we pulled out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the valves were not maintained at all. Uh, to the point where they started to leak to the outside of the pipe, actually. Um, another picture from the same brewery of all the, the gaskets inside the valves. Um, this used to be a sterile air filter. Well, until somebody tried to heat sterilize it, uh, you know, if you try to sterilize plastic with steam, it doesn't go too well. And then you can see also by the color of the, the air filter that the steam was also not really of a great quality. There's a lot of rust in there. And this is actually the inside stainless steel housing from that air filter. And you really can't see any stainless steel at all. Shredded fittings have no place anywhere where we have sanitary conditions. Uh, so, you know, don't use threaded fittings ever. Um, somebody had the genius idea of recovering their iodine and put it in a CIP tank. Well, that's what's left of that tank. Um, this is the inside of the tank. Ironically, you can see where the waterline is. Beneath the waterline, the tank is actually still in fairly decent shape. Uh, above the waterline and the vapor phase, the iodine vapors have completely destroyed the stainless steel and we end up scrapping this tank. Um, yeah, here we have uh, um, actually uh, a, a brew house manway that ended up corroding. <clears throat> um, imploded tanks for various reasons in any size and shape. Uh, yes, you can implode kegs actually. So this is actually a keg that was imploded. Uh, you know, a lot of breweries, especially the bigger ones, go from go from steam to 32 degrees beer, and some of the kegs just don't fare very well with that one. Um, another keg that we found outside there, and this is not an isolated case. We see a lot of those out there. Um, so yeah, they, a lot, lot of things can go wrong, and today we're going to try to understand what we can do to prevent this from happening in the first place. I'd like to quickly throw in a little bit of safety. Every time I do a presentation, I'd like to kick in a little bit of safety. Um, with chemicals, rule number one, don't fear chemicals, respect chemicals. When you fear something, you act awkward, awkward around it. Things have a tendency to go wrong, uh, so you really don't want to do that. Um, yeah, the most important piece of information you have that keeps you safe is the safety data sheet. Uh, technical data sheets are really not that informative. Safety data sheets are specifically written to this particular chemical and give you all the information that you need. So even though you don't have to know every single safety data sheet in the brewery, uh, at least do yourself a favor and look at the ones from the products that you work with on a daily basis. Can't stress enough, having worked in the chemical industry for over 30 years and gotten burned and all kinds of stuff myself, uh, always use all the recommended personal protective equipment. It's the day when you try to rush and don't wear it that you're going to get hurt. Uh, don't rush when handling chemicals. Check the label before handling and dispensing chemicals. Why do I say this? Well, if you have a drum sit in the corner with caustic um, or acid, let's take a good one, and you know everybody knows that that drum is acid. Well, the new hire from yesterday didn't know that you know that's going to be the acid drum, so he put a drum of chlorinated caustic there, and then you think it's acid, and you add this into a tank with acid, and suddenly you have a huge cloud of chlorine gas in the, in the brewery. It's good to know what you're actually working with, and if the drum doesn't have a label, don't use it. Uh, equally important, check all safety equipment before handling chemicals. If you have plumbers in the building and they turn the water off and you get burned and you need a safety shower or an eye shower, it's a bad time to find out that they turned the water off. Um, equally important, always know the location of your nearest safety shower and eyewear station. Maintain and check your personal protective equipment. That means if anything is worn or damaged, you need to replace it. Uh, check for incompatible chemicals in the immediate area. Why do I say this? Uh, best example, packaging area. Somebody is foaming down the filler with a chlorinated uh, alkaline solution uh, while you're doing an acid CIP on the bright beer tank. Uh, well, guess what? Both those go into the same drain. And as we know, acid and chlorine doesn't mix well. So suddenly you have a nice little cloud of chlorine gas in the brewery trying to kill you. So it's good to know what's going on around you and what else is going in the drain that you're working with. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. And as always, avoid distractions while working with chemicals. So just some good safety advice there. Let's jump into the theoretical basics of cleaning. So to really know how to remove soil, we need to kind of you know, understand how soil attaches itself. 
Obviously, the more obvious ways are, you know, mechanically uh, in, you know, cracks or uh, surfaces or, again, we talked about sanitary wells. When those are not done properly, you can get it in there. So everywhere you have a rough surface, soil attaches itself more readily. Uh, it's the same reason why most fermenters um, have a electro-polished uh, bottom uh, cone. And that is for the yeast to just kind of slide out rather than attaching itself to the metal. So if you haven't not noticed that uh, in today's, most fermenters today have an electro-polished uh, bottom cone where the rest of the tank is actually just uh, uh, polished uh, by machines. Um, we have electrostatic binding forces. So for example, protein likes to attach itself to uh, electrically charged surfaces, which is why passivation is so important. So if you have the same cleaning and over time you notice that it becomes more and more difficult to clean your tanks, this could actually be that your tank is losing its passivation. Electrostatic binding forces are starting to occur, which makes the uh, protein um, and mineral salts actually attach themselves more readily and more forcefully to the surface, making it more and more difficult to remove them. Um, so if we know all this then we say okay you know the sum of the energy that we need to produce to overcome all these binding forces is expressed as the adhesion energy just something to know so that's the energy we have to achieve during a cleaning cycle how do we do this well we have chemicals we have mechanics we have temperature we have spray balls we have all kinds of different things that we work with so let's dive a little bit into that um the process of soil removal can be divided into four major steps. So how does this work? We're going to bring the chemical solution to the soil, obviously, uh, after a pre-rinse, of course. We're trying to you know, wet the soil. Uh, now, at this point, chemical reactions and physical processes take place. So with protein, for example, and caustic, we get saponification. With fats, we get emulsification, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so all this stuff is, getting, is, is taking place. Um, then the removal from the soil uh, is actually done via fluid mechanics. So I always say if you have a dirty tank and you can just you know, wipe your deposits very easily off with a finger, the chemicals have done the job, but you have definitely a fluid mechanical problem where uh, you know, the mechanical action wasn't there to take that now prepared soil off the surface. And then finally, we have as a last step, you know, we wanna obviously prevent any removed soil from redepositing itself on the uh, tank surfaces. So that is done through dispersion. Um, and then obviously we wanna transfer that removed soil away from the surface. So we have, we have a, a few parameters that are influencing our cleaning results and they're kind of uh, determined at certain steps of uh, the development of the brewery. So equipment parameters, for example, are often determined during the construction or the purchase of the production equipment. You know, what type of steel are we using? Which type of spray ball are we using? Uh, which pump are we using? Are we using a VFD? Are we not using a VFD? Yada, yada, yada. So all those things we, we refer to as equipment parameters. And if you walk today into an existing brewery, you know, chances are that those equipment parameters are somewhat fixed for you. So you just have to figure out what are they and how can I work with them? But here's also important during the planning uh, steps of a brewery, you know, it's very important that we make good choices about, you know, which materials are we using. Everything has to be chemical compatible, easy to clean, you know, smooth surfaces. We want to try to avoid electrostatic binding forces. Maybe for a hot liquor tank, we want to use, you know, a, a special steel to prevent damage from chlorides and, and the constant heat, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, very important that we know these parameters and can work with them as we grow or as we plan a new brewery. System parameters are kind of determined by the regular operation of the brewery. Uh, you know, what are the chemical composition and quantity of deposits in and on the equipment? Am I brewing lager beers? Am I brewing, you know, stouts, uh, seltzers, um, you know, um, heavy IPAs or light lagers? You know, those will all make a difference in how we clean and how we approach this. What is my what is my frequency of sanitation? What is the soil load in my cleaning solution? Yeah, you know, what's the quality of my process water? You know, specifically hardness, you know, chlorides, uh, and etc. Et uh, what environment is my brewery situated in? So if you're here down in Georgia where we are, you know, it's hot and humid, so you you, have, you fight a lot with 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 mold and with uh, um, you know heat related problems. Where if you're in Arizona, you know, you probably don't worry too much about you know mold growth because everything is just hot and dry. Um, but you're going to have other problems, you know. So it makes a difference. 
and obviously the CIP equipment that I'm working with. Finally, that brings us to the operational parameters. <clears throat> and these are the ones that probably uh, most of you guys are most familiar with uh, since brewing is really just glor glorified cleaning. Um, you know, the chemicals, the mechanics, the temperature, and the time. You know, uh, those are the operators, uh, the, the parameters that we can work with on a daily basis. We can modify these to some extent, um, you know, and <clears throat> to some degree, you know, these are actually interchangeable. So, you know, chemical composition and the activity of our clean solution, which chemicals, acid, caustic, you know, oxidizer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the mechanical activity during the cleaning process, you know, very often is this overlooked. And, you know, during my time selling uh, chemicals and troubleshooting breweries, um, 90 plus percent of problems during the cleaning could be traced back to mechanical problems, you know, not so much chemicals. Can chemicals make a difference? Absolutely. You can overcome mechanical problems with certain, you know, chemicals using more or better chemicals, but the underlying problem was still ultimately a mechanical problem or a fluid mechanical problem. You know, which temperature do I choose for my cleaning process? You know, it makes a difference if you clean a 10 barrel tank or a thousand barrel tank. Yeah. You know? Um, and what is my time allotted for the cleaning process? You know, as you continue to grow bigger and bigger, time becomes more and more of a valuable commodity and you really want to deal with that carefully. So let's quickly touch on some of the things here. You know, um, again, the uh, operational parameters, C, M, T, and Z. You know, ideally we want to have the following formula. Our cleaning result is chemicals, mechanics, time, and temperature. And ideally our cleaning result should always be constant. That means the tank comes out clean every single time. Today, rather than going really deep into chemicals, uh, which I could talk a whole week about, uh, let me quickly talk about water, which very few people talk about. But it's actually, if you think about it, the vast majority of our cleaning solution. Uh, so it is actually the most important chemical that we have to work with is water because it's 95 to 98 percent of our cleaning solution. So, you know, very, very few times do we use chemicals concentrated. We always dilute it with water. Keep in mind the rule is always add the chemical to water, never add water to the chemical. Um, yeah, so it provides us a lot of factors. It provides us the mechanical energy. It provides us the temperature. It provides us, uh, you know, the diluting factor. So uh, a very, very important chemical that we need to understand and work with. So, you know, every water as applied to the brewery contains some kind of salt and solution. You know, for us, the most important ones are calcium and magnesium, because those are the two primary salts that determine the hardness of our water. Um, you know, the hardness is either present in the form of carbonate or hydrogen carbonate uh, is our carbonate hardness. You put those two together. Uh, in addition to maybe also bound CO2, and you have carbonate and non-carbonate hardness, which is the total hardness of the water. Uh, you also find different things, you know, chlorides, sulfates, phosphates. Um, you know, again, all the things you really need to know about because they can make a difference in the taste of the beer. Um, and chlorides, of course, are a big factor for potential damage to your equipment. Of course, chlorides and stainless steel do not play well together. Um, so we get a good, we get a little bit more into this in a second here. Um, you know, zero to sixty we consider is a soft water, sixty-one to one twenty, moderately hard, and then hard water. And if you live in Texas, you know, then one eighty is a good day. Uh, we see two fifty, almost three hundred you know, milligrams per liters there. It's insanely hard water. Um, <clears throat> so then it becomes more and more challenging, also from a chemical side, to work with these. Um, heavy metals, iron, manganese uh, should be mentioned here. They can, you know, definitely play a role in how your water reacts because they're an important factor of the redox system. Uh, if you see in some of the previous tanks, and I can show you another picture here in a second, uh, you know, especially iron and manganese can really wreak havoc on your equipment uh, where it reacts with the stainless steel and starts to cause rust. Um, and then chlorides are especially important with respect to the general corrosive properties of the water. So <clears throat> I always like to reference the thing here. We I came to the Caribbean and to the brewery, and you know we talked about chemicals, and I said no, we don't want to use perosidic acid because it it you know it uh, it wrecks it corrodes our lines, and then everything starts leaking and everything is damaged. And I say, well, PAA doesn't do this. 
you know, there's something else going on. Well, it turns out they had chlorides of 1500 milligrams per liter, 1500 ppm of chlorides in their water. Um, you know, at that concentration of chlorides, you could have put, uh, you know, just a, a little bit dilute vinegar in there and it would have completely destroyed the lines due to the low pH. So chlorides are very important to understand and know about. Uh, it's actually very hard to remove as well. So uh, generally the rule is if you're in your coastal areas, you tend to have higher chloride values than inland. But again, depending on what your water source is in your surrounding areas, uh, let's say, for example, you're near a salt mine or something uh, and the water table touches that salt mine, you can also have very, very high chlorides. Uh, you know, NaCl is the uh, chemical formula for, for cooking salt. Um, so there, there are many different ways for chlorides to get into the water. Plus the cities by law have to chlorinate the water and you know that can actually build up over time in the in the water pipes um, so very very important factor to take into consideration and you really want to have as low as possible chloride in your water as a general rule the lower the ph the higher the temperature the less chloride you really want to have in your water um, just some example of what chloride can do to stainless steel pipes this is all chloride and halogen corrosion yeah, again, just the water here did this to the bottom of the tank. Um, you know, so very, very important. Um, you know, oxygen and we thought about carbon dioxide. You know, here we go. They can affect the carbon uh, carbonate hardness. Important to understand is that, you know, and we find this in hot liquor tanks or hot water tanks, as water hardness constituents are less soluble as the temperature or the pH of the water increases. So if we have the worst case scenario, let's say a hot caustic solution that has a lot of you know, uh, hot water in it, that hot water constituents will precipitate out and leave a film in your vessels. And you've probably seen this after caustic cycles where you still seem to have like a, like a slight white film in your tank. That's actually the water hardness reacting with your caustic solution that is not properly sequestrated. Um, at the very end as you start to rinse out. And then at the very end, you have enough alkalinity in there to precipitate some of the hardness out. And you probably found out that comes out very easily with just a very light acid rinse. So <clears throat> again, it's very important that we understand that hot liquor tanks need to very frequently be descaled uh, because again, high temperature, the water uh, hardness constituents will precipitate out, form a lime scale in that tank. and we saw in the pictures earlier that can cause problems with heat transfer, with potentially uh, also uh, organic growth. Um, <clears throat> you know, so today we really offered a lot of solutions to deal with any water problem that we have. Hard water, we can run it through a softener, chlorides, we can use a, either an ion exchanger or a RO system. Um, so, you know, there, there are many, many different different things out there. And it's important that you talk to somebody that does water treatment for a living if you have problems and make sure that you get the right solution for your particular circumstances. You know, one, one solution does not fit everybody. That's the important thing to take away here. Um, you know, water and its consequences. This is all, these are all pictures that just happen by nothing else than water. Uh, you know, on the top left here, that's actually a hot liquor tank, believe it or not. That brewery turned out had a lot of chlorides in the water as well as iron. And, you know, we found out because that weld here actually failed. Um, so they started looking inside the tank and that's what they found. Uh, we were able to turn this tank back around, actually. It took us about 72 hours and a lot of acid. Um, yeah. Heat exchangers. Yeah, we, we, we see here how uh, the, the pipes can clog up. Uh, caustic uh, keg washer tanks. You know, here we, again, we have high temperature. We have... Um, constantly alkalinity. Um, so this is how the many cake washers look like on the inside and you need to frequently descale those with an acid solution. And here again, we have chlorides on pipes. Um, you know, it's a recipe for, for disaster. Definitely need to rinse those out. Um, I'm sure Andrew mentioned it. If you guys have questions at the end, uh, you know, be happy to answer some of those. I'm kind of just breeze through this. I'm trying to cram about a week's worth of information into an hour. Uh, and then if he wants to, we can we can tag on different, you know, sections of this and look at this more more detailed. Um, mechanics, I mentioned, you know, extremely important. Uh, you cannot remove any deposits without fluid mechanics, period. I don't care how much chemical you throw at it. 
um, you know, it will not come off the equipment unless you have proper fluid mechanics in place. So this is an extremely important part of the cleaning program. And, you know, even most chemical suppliers don't really understand this because they are chemical guys. They're not engineers. They don't deal with fluid mechanics. They don't understand what's really going on. They just get paid to 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 sell your chemicals. So it's important that you know you have a basic understanding of of fluid mechanics and what we need to really watch out for. Um, the the fact is, the more your fluid mechanics are dialed in, the less time you will spend on cleaning and the less money you will spend on chemicals. So having good fluid mechanics can make a huge difference on how much you know how much concentrations you have to run, how long you have to run cycles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we talked about earlier, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, uh, you know, a pre-rinse removes loose soil, not chemically or physically attached to the surfaces. So essentially you want to do a pre-rinse with ambient water. Don't use hot water, uh, for the initial rinse. Uh, you may have to do it later for a step up or step down rinse, but the first rinse should always be ambient. Okay. And the pre-rinse is completed when the water runs out clear. Simple as that. That's it. We're, we're just trying to get the grass of the stuff out there to keep the soil load and our chemical solution as low as possible. Uh, you know, chemicals are transported to the soil to chemically alter the deposits. So again, here we're using water as a as a transport uh, vehicle, and you know, <clears throat> it it is used to wet the thing, uh, uh, the the soils. You know, um, the chemical aspects that we are looking at for cleaning is pressure, volume, and then flow velocity. Okay, and again, volume and flow velocity are two different things, and we're going to talk about this here a little bit in a uh, more detailed way. Uh, manual cleaning applications is more easily because we can apply mechanical energy by brushing, scrubbing, or other physical means, and, and we can see what's going on. But in a closed system, we really heavily rely on, on some math and some basic physics to really make sure this comes out the way we want it to. Okay, so pressure, flow, volume, and flow velocity are determined and affected by the supply and return pumps, of course, uh, which, which CIP spray balls we're using, pipe diameters, the length of the pipe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how much head we have in the system. So we need to do some math and understand really what's going on. So let's talk about tank cleaning mechanics. Uh, you know, here we have two different principles. We have low pressure cleaning, what we call the traditional film or chemical cleaning. We apply a liquid to the sides of the tanks. It runs down the sides of the tanks. As it's running down, it creates your mechanical energy, assuming the film is thick enough, um, and that is our mechanical energy. Uh, high pressure cleaning, or often we have a combination between low and high pressure cleaning. Uh, for example, the whirly birds, you know, we're not really talking about a true cleaning machine, but we're, us we're using some impingement cleaning. Uh, generally around the Krausen rings at the top of the tank. Uh, you know, if you're doing eels, for example, uh, that can significantly help in knocking some of that uh, more stubborn uh, uh, soils off the uh, top of the tank and then relying just on chemical cleaning for the rest. Uh, you know, high pressure cleaning by its true nature is we call impingement cleaning. And those are actually uh, high pressure machines, uh, usually geared spray balls that run for a fixed amount of time uh, and they essentially clean the tank in an ever uh, smaller growing pattern like we, like we see here. And eventually every area of the tank has been contacted and the tank is clean. So the, the benefit from this is it generally is a shorter time. Uh, it is a predetermined amount of time. You know, the, the disadvantage is these things are rather expensive um, you know, and re do re require some maintenance. So for smaller breweries, uh, you know, maybe not always a good solution, but you, know, you can get away with woolly birds or even static spray balls but just so you know what the difference is. So very important here, because I see this a lot, when people move spray balls around the brewery from you know, one tank into another tank, the spray balls must be properly sized and engineered for the tank diameter, volume, and height. Okay, If you try to run too much pressure through a spray ball, it's going to atomize. So you get a very fine mist in your tank, but you don't get a film buildup on the side of the tank and you don't get the mechanical energy you need to clean your tank properly. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where the tank is not clean, but you can easily wipe off the uh, deposits with your finger, uh, you probably have some type of atomization going on where you just don't have enough volume of liquid on the side of your tank 
um, or your pipe for that regard, and it doesn't come clean. So um, on the other hand, if the spray ball is too big and you don't put enough liquid through it, you just get the effect where it doesn't even touch the side of the tank. Uh, you know, it just kind of like like it's like drips down in the middle. So uh, again, it needs to be properly dialed in, and every spray ball comes with a comes with a, a spray curve, a performance curve from the manufacturer. Make sure you have that. It shows you exactly how much pressure and how much volume you can run on the spray ball for this size tank to get optimal results. Spray balls must be self cleaning, of course. Uh, so you know, a threaded design. Uh, a, it's not self cleaning, and B, it's not sanitary. Generally, you know, most spray balls are attached loosely with a pin. And the reason behind this is that water actually forces itself out between those gaps uh, where, the, where the pin is, cleaning that, that, uh, that pipe above it and cleaning the spray ball itself. Okay? Um, tank walls must be evenly applied with cleaning solution. So if you look in your tank and you see two sides are clean and two sides are empty, you probably have a whirly bird that is stuck. Uh, so it's only spraying on two sides of the tank rather than keep rotating and getting liquid everywhere. Uh, you know, spray balls are maintenance uh, pieces, so they need to be frequently removed, cleaned, maintained, put back in. So keep that in mind when you design your tanks with respect to accessibility. And equally important, the applied cleaning film must have a sufficient thickness and volume in order to produce the turbulent flow or the flow mechanics on the side of the tank walls, okay? Um, equally important is to is to, you know, balance the CIP flow. So if you go, let's say, from a from a CIP holding tank and you're trying to go into, um, you know, a, a brewing tank, um, you know, it, it is very tricky because generally the discharge side on the bottom is a process pipe, which can be as thick as, you know, one and a half, two, two and a half inches, depending on the size of the tank and the brewery. Um, but the supply side is a, is a spray ball with tiny holes in it. Um, so it's very tricky to balance the flow. And unfortunately, a lot of breweries resort to throttling the butterfly valve. Well, that works, but unfortunately, what happens is that you end up with dirty pipes. And you wonder yourself, well, the liquid is going through there, though. It's coming back into the tank. What's happening? Well, here we're talking about the, now the, the phenomena of insufficient flow velocity. So we talked about that we need to ha we need to have a certain amount of mechanical energy to clean our equipment. If we don't have that mechanical energy, and in pipes and cones, this is done by water flowing again over the surface. When the water pools inside the cone, or the water just runs very slowly uh, along in the pipes, we don't get the mechanical action uh, to clean the pipes. Okay, these are actually. Uh, outlet pipes beneath the tank, and we see that there's definitely a problem, okay? Now, we went from this to this, doing nothing else but opening that butterfly valve, okay? That's all we did. <clears throat> we simply provided enough flow back, and that butterfly valve, by the way, was not on the supply side, it was on the return side. So they were, they were throttling the return, which was a you know a fairly large outlet here. I think those were like maybe 800 barrel tanks um, to compensate the the lower flow on the supply side. So what do you say? What what do I do here? Well, the the secret to overcome this is called VFD, variable frequency drive, and putting that on a um, little you know automation system that essentially runs it up and down, uh, so you get at least 50% of the time sufficient flow and the rest of the time you know the 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 system can catch up with return flow uh <clears throat> on the side here uh again we have a return pump we have we have a supply pump so if we modulate both pumps to the point where we get an even flow if we just get 50 percent of the time sufficient flow through here makes all the difference and we go from this to this it's the same pipe and all we did there is open that valve okay so again, flow velocity, super important. So talk about what really happened there. You know, what is what is different between laminar flow and turbulent flow? What we see here in the picture was laminar flow, the water kind of runs through the pipes in a very organized, uh, you know, calm way. Um, which is great for beer, you know, if you if you try to transfer beer and you don't try to get you know word shear on the on the brewing side, we're looking for this. The problem is when people are using word pumps for CIP they end up getting this when they really want this, 
okay? So <clears throat> it is a good idea uh, if you're using a word pump, again, VFD is the, is, the, is the magic word here, you know, crank that thing up and make it run much, much faster when you run a CIP. Yes, you wanna transfer your word, you know, very carefully so you don't get word shear, but with CIP solutions, we're looking for the exact opposite. We're looking for, you know, rapid flows through the pipes, which then causes actually the liquid to uh, experience some uh, resistance on the pipe uh, surfaces, you know, because the pipe is never completely smooth. If we now run the liquid very fast through that pipe, we start to create little turbulence along the pipes itself on the sides. That turbulence is our mechanical energy. That turbulence is actually what cleans our system, okay? If we don't have this, then the pipes will not come clean. The good news is that in a, in, a, in a pipe system, we can actually calculate this very easily through what's called a Reynolds number. Yeah. And I took this here out. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, it's a very basic formula. It is pipe diameter, flow, you know, uh, viscosity, yada, 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 those things. And you can very easily calculate uh, your Reynolds number. Um, you know, keep in mind when designing piping system, you know, turbulent flow requires a higher input of energy from a pump than laminar flow. And as I mentioned earlier, if we have, you know, word pump, for example, on the brew house side and try to use these for CIP cleaning, you know, we need to really crank this thing up. Um, <clears throat> Laminar flow occurs at low Reynolds numbers. We have a medium number where it's transitional flow, and then we have you know turbulent flow above a certain number. Uh, you know, so if you get your brewery engineered from a, from a consultant or something, they will make sure that the Reynolds number is always high enough that it it's not in the transitional period, and uh, you know uh, it's going to be well above uh, the number where it's going to be. Um, Flow and that's the uh, you know, 2300 is kind of where it's accepted to be, you know, getting turbulent. But honestly, you really don't design a system with less than 4000 just to be on the safe side. Um, you know, when designing a system and, and sizing the pump, also very important, you know, what, what head pressure do I have to overcome? How long are my pipes? You know, if, you, if you're running 50 feet or 500 feet, you know, that makes a big difference. You know, how many elbows do I have in here? I remember when JV Northwest uh, delivered their first 50 barrel systems to, I think it was um, Firestone Walker. Uh, the, the brewery was called different uh, back then. Um, and uh, it had so many elbows and, and stuff in it that it wouldn't come clean. So they had to redesign it, you know. So it's just lessons that, that, that you learn through engineering. But every time you put an elbow in there, every time you put a T in there, you know, it reduces your, your flow velocity and it, it causes friction. Um, you know, <clears throat> piping, you really want to stay with the same pipe diameter. Whenever, whenever it's possible, I put a, design, a little example here. If you go from a DIN 80 to a DIN 100, uh, which is actually uh, two inches, up to, I'm sorry, three inches to four inches, um, you know, which is not double the size, but your flow velocity will drop from two meters per second to 1.25 meters a second, almost half. At this point, you no longer have turbulent flow in your pipe. So it's very important that we don't make big jumps in pipe diameter. You know, if you have to make any jumps at all, it should be a transitional, uh, you know, a slowly and transitional change. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as we see in the next picture here, there's a bunch of different things that can happen. If we make sudden sudden jumps in pipe, we can get, you know, air pockets here, we can get air pockets here. Even, uh, you know, inline instruments can cause problems if they're not properly sized and the T is not properly sized for the, for the line or the, uh, the sensor is too big, we can get, you know, turbulent flow here, but unfortunately it's turbulent here. It is no liquid getting here. So we've had this before. Uh, dead legs is another thing to watch out for. You know, uh, the rule is generally three times pipe diameter is considered a dead leg. So if you have a one inch pipe and there's a three inch, you know, stick uh, from, from a transition or something or a valve sticking out, you know, that is a dead leg. That's, this will not get properly clean. So you wanna make sure that you have a valve shutting this off really right here so you don't have these, these extensions in your piping. This is a common problem in, bre in breweries that have grown over time and pipes have been abandoned or redesigned. And then you have all these like dead end pipes in the brewery that you kind of overlooked. Um, let's talk a little bit about time. Uh, you know, but we need to know what time is that we can't force certain, uh, certain chemical uh, 
your reactions past a certain time. It just takes a certain amount of time for certain things to take place. You know, uh, can we can we shorten a 90 minute CIP uh, cycle to 20, 25 minutes? Yes, and we have, you know. Um, can we go much below that? Probably not. Simply, it takes a while for the, you know, the chemicals to get to the, the soil, for the soil to get wetted, for the chemical reaction, you know, maybe saponification or dispurgation or emulsification taking place, uh, you know, so Time is, is definitely something that, that, that we want to keep a close eye on. Um, but at the same time, especially on the chemical side, we can push it beyond certain limits, okay? Um, some things we can do a lot is most people rinse too long. Um, so we often find that people rinse five or six minutes when really three minutes would be enough, you know, and if you think about how much water is going down a drain on how much of a valuable commodity water has become these days, especially if you're out West, you know, um, it's, it's definitely worthwhile to, to take some time and kind of see, okay, you know, when am I actually rinsed out? And you can easily do this after a cleaning cycle by starting your rinse cycle and every 30 seconds you take a sample at the drain. And then you titrate those those samples and take a pH or do a litmus test uh, with a, you know a fin of telling and 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 see when when am I actually properly rinsed out? And if you find yourself, you know you you you're doing a six minute cycle, but really after a minute and a half you have no chemical residue left, then tag on another thirty or sixty seconds and call the day. You know, uh, but then again you've dialed your rinse cycle from sixty from six minutes to three minutes. That is half the amount of water. And you multiply that by the number of tank cleanings you do each year, and you will find that this is a significant amount of money uh, and resources that you're not putting down the drain. Okay. Uh, important here to understand too that you sometimes have mixing going on in the pipes. So you know if you're pushing out, for example, a cleaning cycle with water, you know you really don't have clean water until a few seconds or minutes into the cycle, depending on how, how big your brewery is, because uh, you got to push the chemical first out of the system. Pre-rinse, you know, very, very simple time rule. The pre-rinse is done when the water runs out clear. Simple as that. So if you keep an eye on your water, again, you can do rinse samples. If you see, hey, after 30 seconds, after a minute, water runs out clear, I'm done with my, with my pre-rinse. On the cleaning side, again, depending on the chemical, you know, you can use... Uh, you know, phenolphthalein for caustic. Uh, keep in mind, if your water itself is, is alkaline, that might not work. So you have to go with conductivity or something like this. Uh, you know, acid, you can use conductivity, pH, et cetera, et cetera. But see, when am I actually rinsed out, you know, and, and what do I really need to, to, to do here? So there's definitely things that I promise you, you will be able to save. Um, you know, <sighs> The cleaning times, if you have a CIP system and it's a single CIP system and you use it for everything and it's automated, you're always bound to the longer CIP cycle because you only have one program. So even though the one system would potentially only take 30 minutes, but let's say my Whirlpool takes 90 minutes, everything runs for 90 minutes. You know, that's the drawback if you share CIP systems throughout the various parts of the brewery. Yeah. You know, um, so if you if you do this, make sure you always go for the longest cycle necessary because you don't want anything to not be clean. Okay. Uh, if you do it manually, at that point you can really dial in your SOPs and say, okay, for this year I need this much chemical and this much rinse time, and for this time for this one I need this much chemical and this much rinse time. So if you if you really spend some time on this, there's a lot of things that can be done uh, and a lot of time that can be saved. Uh, you know, again, it's 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 work you put in once, and then you're kind of reaping the benefits afterwards. Uh, intermediate rinse in between chemicals. You know, sometimes you can skip that altogether. Uh, so, for example, you know, if you if you do a final rinse with your sanitizer, which I always recommend, don't leave sanitizers in your brewery unrinsed. They will they will damage your equipment. So, if you do an acid and then follow with an acid sanitizer, let's say PAA, you don't really have to rinse between the acid and the sanitizer. They will you know, it will not affect the parasitic acid. Um, so do the final rinse and then you're good to go. You know, if you have incompatible chemicals, for example, alkaline, you know, you run a caustic cycle followed by an iodine uh, cycle, then, you know, you need to make sure all the alkalinity is out of there uh, because, you know, iodine is actually uh, made ineffective through uh, alkalinity. Um, 
talked about that. You know, final wins is another thing. You know, the final wins is the complete and total absence of previous used chemicals or products. So once this has been done, you know, you're done. I always recommend on the final wins, put a safety buff of maybe one minute in there uh, just to make sure in case somebody used a little bit more chemical, something that is, is still properly rinsed out. Talk about temperature really quick. You know, temperature is primarily determined by the deposit, uh, composition of the deposit. So every time we run caustic, uh, whenever possible, you want to clean hot. And the simple reason is that the, the uh, chemical process of uh, removing protein is saponification. Saponification takes most readily place at high temperatures, um, high pH. So um, you, know, you will have greatly, you will, you will need to use greatly less chemical and less time by increasing the temperature. 80 Celsius or 180 Fahrenheit is generally you know, where I would stop. Uh, you don't have to take it any further than that. So on the brew house side, definitely run everything at 180. Um, you know, if you go on the tank side, it gets a little more tricky, you know, because uh, um, of the size of the tank potentially. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, pre-rinse is always ambient, uh, and this is because you get you get protein denaturation above 95, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, same reason why our body starts shutting down when we have a fever. Uh, our body is you know, full of enzymes and proteins uh, that, are, that are getting blocked and destroyed by high fever. Same thing in the brewery, really. It's no different. Uh, you want to you know, not, get, not give your tank a fever doing the, doing the pre-rinse and doing ambient rinse. It will make caustic cleaning you know, much less difficult. Um, acids, generally, there's no benefit using it hot. The only time we really use acids hot is, for example, in a keg washer. And why are we doing this? Because it gives us additional antimicrobial effects. The, the temperature will kill you know, bacteria, especially at that low pH. Uh, you know, I thought I'd say the magic rule for cleaning fermenters without any oxidizer or additive is about 120 to 130 Fahrenheit. If you're able to get it to that temperature, at least for a short period of time during a CIP cycle, uh, chances are you will get the tank really completely clean and you won't be needing any uh, oxidizer you know, in like, like peroxide or something to get it clean. Uh, you know, as the tanks get much larger, of course, that gets more tricky. Uh, you know, the pressure differential uh, can cause potentially implosions. So unless you have a you know, safety system set up in your tanks or you have a giant manway that, that, that you can open up to provide for, for sufficient gas exchange, you know, that's where you have to really be careful. Because if you have an employer that just makes a boo boo and opens up the wrong valve, you know, uh, cold water instead of hot water, then you, know, you can say bye bye to your tank. Uh, at the same time, chemistry had made, has made huge advantages uh, over the past several years, where we can now get uh, tanks very easily cleaned, even with you know low and ambient pH. Uh, you know, keep in mind that the synergistic circle, that's what I call these four elements in the circle, are interchangeable within limits. So you know, if we say okay, we can use you know high temperature the addition of either oxidative additives or additional time, higher chemical concentration, uh, maybe a different spray ball, you know, could be used to compensate for the temperature restrictions, you know, set by the equipment. Yeah. And again, we have special CIP regimens uh, that, we, that we can use for ambient tank cleaning. And then, you know, if, see here what happens if you don't follow, you know, these uh, recommendations. I talked about large tanks. You know, this was actually a new brewer, first day on the job at night by, by himself, running a hot caustic into a tank full of CO2. That didn't go well. And how quickly a tank explodes, we see on this one here, you know, uh, there is no warning. It goes from tank there to tank B and imploded uh, without any warning. So it's important that we do know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, again, single most important precondition for successful sanitizing is, you know, you need to sanitize. And I was going to quickly go through the sanitizers, but actually I'm not going to. I'm going to skip this here um, and maybe save this for another day. Uh, so at this point here, what I would say is probably more relevant to get into some questions and then save this for another day. So, Andrew, I'll give that back to you. Thank you.
mm-hmm. up in your stream just now. So much great information you put out there. If anyone is interested in reaching out to you with any further questions, what's the best way they can do so? Um, let's see. I had it on the, uh, let me share this again here on my first uh, slide here. Hang on. Give we you can drop your email question. address in the chat, or if anyone wants to yeah. reach out to Dirk Field, reach out to me. You'll probably find me in Crafty Professionals. I don't think it'll be too hard. Yeah. So here's my email in case you need me. It's a... I believe there's a lot of people brewing right now, so I imagine they'll have this on their playlist for later today. I'm going to drop Dirk's email address in the chat. It doesn't appear we have any questions. But if anybody does have any questions, we just put the email address. You can get a hold of Dirk in the sure. chat. I'm sure he'll be glad to help you. But Dirk, okay. appreciate your knowledge as always again. And hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Thank you. You too. Cheers. Take care. Cheers.